Hey guys, I'd really appreciate if you could give this video a big thumbs up. The more likes a video gets, the more YouTube will recommend it to other viewers through the algorithm. That like button is super important for helping grow the channel and get my content in front of more eyes. Thank you. I'm a girl in my late 20s, trying to make it on my own. After ending an unhealthy relationship, I decided a solo trip was what I needed to reset and rediscover myself. I found this cute little rental room online in a quiet neighborhood. It seemed perfect, affordable, and a chance to stay with a local family for that authentic experience. The guy who answered the door was younger than I expected, maybe mid-30s, but he had an easygoing smile and kind eyes as he welcomed me in. I couldn't help but notice how handsome he was, tall and well-built with thick brown hair and chiseled features. His eyes crinkled at the corners in a way that made me feel instantly at ease and maybe even a little flustered. As he showed me around, I admired his casual confidence and warm sense of humor. When he stood close to point something out, I caught a hint of his subtle cologne which made my heart flutter for a moment. Get it together, I chided myself. He's just being friendly. But I couldn't deny there was something undeniably attractive about this guy. The house was nicely kept, if a bit cluttered with personal items. He showed me up the narrow staircase to my room, simple but clean with a window overlooking the backyard. Make yourself at home, he said. There's a lock on the bedroom door if you ever want some privacy. Over the next few days I settled into a routine. I'd explore the nearby parks and cafes during the day then come back and settle into my room to read or write in the evenings. My host and I coordinated bathroom time in the mornings, but otherwise kept to ourselves. He seemed polite and respectful of boundaries. Then one night, I was awoken by a loud thump outside my door. At first, I dismissed it as the house settling, until I heard the rattling doorknob. I froze under the covers, my heart pounding. That's when I heard his muffled voice through the door. Hey, open up, it's me. Want to have some fun? Cold dread washed over me. This wasn't happening. Maybe I was still dreaming. But then came another thump, like he was throwing himself against the door. I shrank back in terror. You can't just hide. Let me in. I'm not going to do anything. Just want to see you. Without clothes. He giggled. I fumbled for my phone with shaking hands. I needed the police ASAP. The dispatcher's questions felt agonizingly slow as I huddled on the floor, jumping at every creak and groan. She advised me to stay hidden, and assured me officers were on the way. Those ten minutes waiting for the police were absolutely harrowing. My host kept muttering unintelligible things and throwing himself against the door, as if he could break through by sheer force of will. I pulled my suitcase in front of the door as an extra barricade. Finally, I heard sirens in the distance. My rescue. The police arrived and quickly got the distraught man under control. I gave my statement with shaky breaths, still trying to process what had just happened in this place where I was supposed to feel safe. The officer told me my host had a history of mental illness that had clearly gone unchecked. The attention of uniforms and flashing lights drew neighbors out. They shook their heads sadly, as if they had sensed something like this coming, but didn't act. In the chaos, I grabbed my belongings and left. The fresh night air had never tasted so sweet. I caught a ride to the nearest hotel, thankful to be putting distance between me and that terrifying incident. The hotel clerk didn't bat an eye at my disheveled appearance checking in well past midnight. As the adrenaline finally started to wear off though, images of that wild-eyed man hurling himself at my door began to haunt me. I tossed and turned, dreading the vulnerable moments of falling asleep when those memories might slip into my subconscious. What if he came after me? Shaken, I decided to cut my trip short and just head home to regroup. My solo journey of self-discovery had taken an incredibly dark turn, but at least I was alive. I tried to push away any what-if questions about how that night could have ended differently. How quickly a stranger's unraveling mental state had put me in peril. In the days and weeks that followed, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, haunted by that experience. It would take time to regain my ease, to not flinch at every unexpected sound. But I was determined to work through it, to not let one traumatic night rod me of my sense of self-reliance and curiosity about the world. I hoped that my host was getting the help he so clearly needed. 
and I hoped I could once again travel and open myself up to new experiences without fear. Until then, I would be changing the locks, just in case. My wife and I both work hard at our jobs to support our family. With two kids, money is always tight, so when we had the opportunity to rent a beautiful villa in the mountains for a week this summer, we jumped at the chance. It seemed too good to be true, an amazing place for an incredibly low price. But we didn't question it. We were just excited to get away and spend some quality time together as a family. The drive up the winding mountain roads was beautiful, with breathtaking views all around us. We couldn't believe our luck when we finally arrived at the villa. It was even more spectacular than the photos online. An enormous wooden cabin nestled amongst towering pines, with a huge wraparound deck overlooking a pristine lake. The interior was just as impressive. Soaring ceilings, a massive stone fireplace, and cozy yet elegant furnishings. The kids were over the moon, already racing to claim the best bedrooms. That first evening, we barbecued on the deck, the kids splashing in the lake as the sun dipped behind the peaks. Exhausted from the journey, we were all in bed early. The whole family huddled under plush comforters as fat raindrops began pattering on the roof overhead. I remember lying there, my wife's warm body pressed against mine, feeling totally at peace. For once, the pressures of work and bills were a million miles away. I'm not sure what time it was when I first heard the noises. A creak, a thump. At first I just dismissed it as the old house settling and groaning in the storm, but it grew louder, more insistent, like something was moving through the hallways. I could hear the floorboards straining under a weight. My heart began pounding in my chest as a child's giggle echoed through the villa. It can't be. The kids are here with us, I tried to reassure myself. But even as I did, a cold chill crept across my skin. I shook my wife awake and she looked at me with wide, frightened eyes. She had heard it too. I could see the terror mirrored in her face. We laid there petrified, clutching each other, as the footsteps moved inexorably towards our bedroom door. A scratching sound, like long nails dragging across wood, then three heavy knocks, rapping slowly. Thump, thump, thump. An eternity seemed to pass before the noises finally faded away. At first light, I crept out to investigate, forcing myself to appear calmer than I felt for the sake of my terrified family. Every hair on my body stood on end as I moved through the cavernous rooms, dust motes swirling in the shafts of morning light. The floorboards were still warm where I cut off that thought before I could spiral further into panic. There were no signs that anyone else had been in the house, no traces of an intruder. Just as I turned to reassure my wife and kids, my eyes landed on a gruesome sight. Three deep gouges carved into the wooden door frame, wicking dark stains into the grain. We beat a hasty retreat, throwing our belongings haphazardly into the car and peeling out of there like the hounds of hell were on our heels. My kids were crying. My wife was white as a sheet. And if I'm being honest, I was scared out of my wits too. We didn't stop until we reached a greasy spoon diner on the interstate the kind of place with excellent home fries but sketchy health code violations. As we huddled over a tabletop jukebox and mugs of stale coffee, I noticed the ancient cashier lady staring at us with cloudy, roomy eyes. Y'all look like y'all seen a ghost, she croaked in a smoker's rasp. Her leathery face was carved with a thousand wrinkles, tributaries of wisdom etched by a hard life. Not quite, I muttered, shoving a forkful of eggs into my mouth. My wife shot me a look, one that clearly said don't start anything. But the old woman had already shambled over to our booth, resting a skeleton hand on the tabletop. Y'all was up at that villa, weren't you? She fixed me with a penetrating gaze that seemed to pin me to the cracked vinyl seat. Ooh boy, you folks got out there just in time. She nodded slowly as we exchanged apprehensive glances. Yep. That place ain't been right since the Dallin family cult massacre of 93. As she filled us in on the horrific details over a never-ending series of burnt, muddy refills, I realized we had unknowingly booked our too-good-to-be-true family vacation at the site of over a dozen ritualistic murders committed by a radicalized doomsday cult. Evidently, the villa had been constructed on the very spot where the Dowlins' following had been discovered. 
a cross-legged ring of rotting corpses, many dismembered or mutilated, surrounding a ramshackle wooden altar slick with fresh blood. According to the old waitress, no one had been able to rent out the property since then, despite numerous attempts. Rumor had it the spirits of the cult victims still lingered, restless and vengeful. They didn't take kindly to outsiders encroaching on their gruesome resting place. Every previous tenant had fled within the first few nights, scared out of their wits by strange noises and malevolent presences. One couple even claimed to have awakened to find the phrase, join us, scrawled across their bedroom mirror in what appeared to be bloody finger paint. As I took another sip of lukewarm, gritty coffee, I made a promise to myself then and there, no more discount vacations booked on shady websites. It's one thing to cut corners, but risking my family's safety is one gamble I'll never take again. My wife reached across the table and squeezed my hand tightly, her eyes brimming with tears. We didn't have to say a word to know we were thinking the exact same thing. It's going to take me a long time to get the sound of those knocks, those footsteps, out of my head. But I'll consider myself lucky if I never again have to experience the mind-bending fear that gripped me in that goddamned house of unholy horrors. A few years back, I was working at a marketing agency, grinding away at my desk day after day. The work was pretty tedious, but it paid the bills. I had my routines, my favorite local spots I'd go to unwind after long hours at the office. Nothing too crazy. That all changed when Sam, one of the account managers at my company, convinced me to attend this marketing convention out in Denver with her. She was super pumped about it. All the big names in our industry would be there giving talks and leading workshops. Sam loves that stuff and is always looking to take her career to the next level. I'm a little more laid back about work, but she can be persuasive. The convention did seem like it could be valuable from a networking perspective. Plus it was a chance to get out of town for a few days. Sam found this Airbnb rental that looked nice and wasn't too far from the convention center. Some old house that had been renovated, modern amenities, but still had a vintage, rustic kind of charm to it. We figured it would be a decent place to hang our hats for a few nights. Little did we know the horror that awaited. We landed in Denver on a Wednesday evening and took a lift over to the Airbnb. Our host, this guy named Randy, showed us around the place. He struck me as a bit odd, but I tried not to read too much into it. Graying shaggy hair, probably late fifties or so. A little bulbous around the middle, but not overly out of shape. He had this strange perpetual half smile plastered on his face as he gave us the tour, motioning dramatically like a cheesy museum guide. Something about him seemed off. And this is the laundry room. You kids are free to use the machines anytime, no extra charge. Just try to be mindful of the upstairs tenant, Mr. Byers. He works some pretty wacky hours. Randy chuckled awkwardly at his own attempt at humor. Mr. Byers? I didn't recall anything in the listing about there being a tenant. An unsettling feeling started to creep in, but I tried to dismiss it. I was just being paranoid, probably residual stress from all the craziness at work leading up to this trip. Once Randy finished the grand tour, Sam and I got settled into our respective bedrooms. I tried to relax, but my mind kept drifting back to the offhand comment about the upstairs tenant. I pulled out my laptop to dig into this a bit more. The listing did indeed make no mention of tenant or long-term resident. There were a couple reviews that seemed to obliquely reference the owner or the guy upstairs being awake at all hours, making noises and being generally disruptive. But these were pretty vague and sporadic. Maybe it was no big deal. Maybe this Mr. Byers character kept to himself. I tried to give myself a pep talk, to not work myself into a panic over essentially nothing. Easier said than done. The first couple nights were fine, all things considered. Some initial creaks and bumps from overhead didn't seem too out of the ordinary for an old house. But then, on our third night there, things took a turn. I was awoken by a series of heavy thumps coming from directly above the ceiling. It sounded like someone was dropping bowling balls at three in the morning. Do you hear that? I called out to Sam in the next room. Yeah, I've been hearing it on and off for the past hour. Super weird, right? She called back. As the thumping gradually died down and an uneasy silence returned, I heard another sound, footsteps, 
heavy, plodding footsteps traveling in a circle around the room above ours. Over, and over, and over again, like someone was possessed and compelled to retrace the same path with militaristic, relentless precision. This went on for what felt like hours, just a continuous loop of pacing. I tried to force myself to get some sleep. A deep, raspy voice, mumbling incoherently yet incessantly through the floorboards above. I couldn't make out any distinguishable words, just this ominous, droning, static-like rumble, like some kind of deranged ritual was being carried out up there. Sleep didn't come that night, and the next morning, I could tell from Sam's haggard, almost traumatized expression that she hadn't fared much better. We didn't need to say anything to each other. Our fears about this Mr. Byers were confirmed. He was clearly unwell, possibly dangerous. But what could we do? This was our one chance to experience the convention we had paid good money for and traveled across the country to attend. Cutting our losses and bailing on the place would be a huge hassle and expense. We tried to convince ourselves that if we laid low and avoided Mr. Byers at all costs for the next couple days, we could simply get through this. Maybe he was just an eccentric night owl. Relatively harmless, right? Wrong. That night, the pacing and murmuring was accompanied by a new, unnerving element. The occasional metallic creak, like a door slowly being inched open. A hollow, shuddering rasp, almost like something, or someone, was being dragged across the floor in agonizingly small increments. Sleep was impossible. I felt like I was trapped in a waking nightmare, counting down the hours until morning with Sam. Both of us jumping at every little sound, shadows taking on menacing shapes in the darkness. We had deluded ourselves into thinking this could be no big deal, but there was clearly something deeply disturbed about this Mr. Byers. Something criminal, based on the noises we were hearing. My heart was pounding out of my chest just waiting for, I don't know what, for him to finally break through the ceiling, or worse, make his way downstairs. When daylight finally came, we decided then and there we couldn't stay another night. The hell with the convention and worrying about money. We weren't going to become casualties of whatever psycho torture chamber was being operated above our heads. So we threw our belongings into our suitcases and got out of there. We didn't even bother checking out with Randy or asking for a refund. Not worth potentially crossing paths with Mr. Byers and his night terrors. As we were hauling our stuff out to the car, though, I noticed a rusted old metal hatch on the side of the house, ajar ever so slightly, a sliver of darkness beckoning from within. I felt a chill run down my spine and quickly averted my gaze. We don't know what happened in that house, or what's become of Mr. Byers, and we never want to find out. All I know is, Sam and I learned a hard lesson about the perils of budget travel and taking a chance on sketchy accommodations. That place was a fresh horror, something ripped straight from hell. I just thank God we made it out of there alive.